Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar series of the Copernicus Climate Change Service Energy Service. Uh, this is the first webinar in the series. Uh, my name is Alberto Trocoli, and I am the CEO of the Inside Climate Service, uh, which is the lead contractor for the C3S Energy Service. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you this uh, webinar and share it. Uh, we have a great lineup and uh, uh, I look forward to hearing the uh, talks today and uh, also your questions. Uh, we look forward to many questions from you. There's ample time for, for the questions. So we'll be together for the next uh, hour and a half. And uh, I will start uh, by just uh, showing briefly what the C3S Energy is about, but we'll learn more about that in the next presentations. So the uh, the next with the, with this slide, I just want to show you uh, a little bit about the configuration of the C3S Energy, and it's composed of uh, climate indicators which are converted into energy indicators. As you see here, the main indicators are the PV solar power, wind power, onshore, offshore, electricity demand, and hydropower generation. You will also hear a lot uh, about the streams that we have. We call them streams. So these are the three uh, periods uh, or streams, like I said, um, that uh, we consider. So one is historical, which goes from uh, the 1950, apologies for the, the wrong label there, to present. And then seasonal forecasts go from uh, um, 1993 to 2016 for the hindcast and then uh, the current period and uh, six months ahead. And then the projection period from uh, around uh, 2020 to 2100 with various models and scenarios. Um, so I, I won't spend too much time on that, like I said, because we have some great presentations coming up and um, I want to just show you here the agenda. So we'll have uh, um, the an introduction from uh, Nube, which uh, who I'll introduce in a minute. And then uh, with two presentations more technical from our team and the Inside Climate Service. The uh, just information about the webinar, the uh, uh, audio and video are deactivated by default in this webinar setup and uh, you can uh, submit your questions in the Q&A section, as you can see in the uh, logo there, the, the icon. We will address them uh, verbally after the presentations, as you saw from the program. But additionally, some questions may be answered also in writing during the webinar. So feel free to uh, type your questions at any time and we will answer uh, them uh, as best we can. The uh, webinar will be recorded and will be available online. So I will now introduce the first speaker, like I said, uh, Nube, uh, Nube Gonzalez uh, Reviriego is the Energy and Agriculture Technical Officer of the Copernicus Climate Change Service at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. She has a PhD in climate and extensive experience in co-developing and implementing climate services for different sectors, including renewable energy, agriculture, and health with both private and public institutions. She has participated as a climate services uh, scientist in many national and European projects and is currently involved in the operational delivery of C3S services to the energy sector. Importantly, uh, Nube is looking after the uh, contract for C3S Energy and it's a pleasure to have Nube here to present to give us an introduction about uh, the service. Over to you, Nube, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alberto. Let me share my screen. Uh, well, I, you you need to stop sharing your screen for me to share it. In any case, welcome everyone to this um, Copernicus Climate Change Service um, series of webinar. As Albert, Alberto mentioned before, I think you can see my screen now. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a really pleasure for me 
to be here today, just introducing the, um, the climate uh, change service of the Copernicus program. And uh, yeah, let me... Sorry, Nube, if I could yeah. just ask you. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Yes. Let me start the presentation by just um, talking about what happened yesterday. So yesterday was a very busy day for our colleague at C3S because we launched the European State of the Climate for the year 2023. And uh, this is a report, a joint effort of the Copernicus Climate Change Service and the World Meteorological Organization. And let me start this, um, this introduction just showing this um, infographic in which you can see the key climate extreme event in 2023. And also you can see the huge impact that this uh, key event have, have uh, on society, as you can see in this uh, in the bottom square. Uh, but the question is, uh, do this uh, key event affect the energy sector? And the, ask, the answer is yes, of course. Just a few examples are the extremely high temperature uh, recorder over the, the last summer in the southern part of Europe just affect the electricity demand and uh, which was above uh, average uh, for most of the, of the summer. But also another um, example is the how the the potential for wind power production was above normal during the last winter, just due to a high um, activity of wind storm across Europe. So this is just a few examples for the energy sector, but of course there are more implications. I encourage you to read the, the report, but this, um, let me introduce the, 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 uh, the Copernicus Climate Change Service, because basically, uh, we would like to offer uh, open and um, auto authoritative uh, climate information for society. And I think this is very important, have it ready in advance for society and for people to make decisions just in an informed and smart way. So this is basically what Copernicus would like Copernicus Climate Change would like to do is support society by providing authoritative information about the past, present, and future climates in Europe, but also for the rest of the world. If I would like, if I have to explain C3S in just in a nutshell, I will say that we provide reliable and open data set. All of them are free of charge for every everyone that would like to use it, but also. Um, we provide the full traceability of our climate information, providing documentation and the workflow and the code behind this climate information. And also we add a layer of um, quality information regarding our data set. And um, finally, we also would like to showcase how different sector, including the energy sector, uh, use the C3S data for real application. So the Copernicus Climate Change Service is just a service under the umbrella of the Copernicus program, which is the Earth Obser Observation component on, of the European Union's space program. And just a little bit of flavor regarding the numbers behind the C3S. So we have more than 285,000 users our users are coming from mainly from Europe and Asia, but also we have users from all the rest of the continents. Uh, the data downloaded from, the, from our services is above 150 petabytes. And um, how the user can access to this data set? So basically, um, the backbone of the C3S is our climate data store that you can access online. And it shows a catalog of data set and also an application. And um, 
you can go in and download all the data set manually, but also exist the possibility to use an API for the automatic downloading of our data set. And also in the Climate Data Store, you can access to the Climate Atlas, which is, a, is an interactive um, visualizator of the different um, climate data set that we provide at C3S. And of course, also we provide user support for any uh, issue regarding our data. Well, the main uh, data set behind the, uh, the CDS are the climate reanalysis, the seasonal forecast, and the climate projection. And I will show you a little bit about each of them. So at the C3S, we offer an ecosystem of reanalysis product for both global and um, regional reanalysis. We have um, the ERA-5 reanalysis, which, is, um, which provides um, information without gaps about uh, variable on atmosphere, land, and ocean waves. And um, it started in 1940 onwards, and it has a, a resolution of 30 kilometers. But also we have some uh, ERA-5 land reanalysis, which is focusing just for land surface variables, and then Serra and, Car and Carra, which are um, European and Arctic reanalysis. At C3S, we, you can also find the seasonal forecast. We provide um, daily forecast from all the European seasonal producing center, but also from the American, uh, Canadian, and uh, Japanese uh, producing center. And very soon, we will able to uh, provide the seasonal prediction coming from the Australian Meteorological Center. Um, apart from this daily data, we offer a monthly statistic and monthly anomalies. And then also through the um, through the C3S, you can access to our graph graphical products, which mainly are uh, spa spa spatial maps for, um, Europe, for different regions and also global maps. And also we offer uh, temporal series for different variables, in particular for um, sea surface temperature. And then also we uh, provide um, uh, metrics, verification metrics that um, provide you with an idea of how the, the seasonal prediction match with the observation in the past. At the C3S, uh, you can find also a climate change projection. C3S acts as a bridge from the ESGF dataset, and we offer a subset of uh, climate projection coming from CIMIC-5, CIMIC-6, and also from CORDEX regional climate projection. The added value of using the CDS for accessing to the climate projection is that we offer a quality control of the data set that we are providing. And also you can find documentation and data tutorials on how to use this data. But on top of this um, data set that we are offering through the Climate Data Store, we also offer um, sectorial um, information, as for instance, the operational service for the energy sector. As Alberto has already um, introduced before, the operational service for the energy sector is currently providing um, climate and energy indicator for Europe derived from reanalysis. And also we are providing um, this information derived from climate projection. This is what we have currently now and was developed in a previous phase of the operational services for the energy sector. But um, currently we are developing the second phase of the, um, of the operational service in which we would like to enlarge our data set for covering the, 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 the world domain instead of only Europe. 
we would like to um, include historical data and climate change projection data, but also we are including seasonal prediction for the energy sector. And um, we, are, we will provide, again, climate indicator and energy indicator. And we would like to um, introduce to this new phase of the, um, of the operational services in these series of webinars that we are starting today. So I will encourage you to keep tuned and uh, listening all the information that we would like to, um, to offer to you. And just to, to add that um, this information will be soon available at the Climate Data Store, but um, still is not uh, there. So I think the timeline will be something around um, by the end of summer or something like that. Um, just also relevant for the energy sector and for the um, for the operational uh, delivery uh, of uh, climate information are the C3S climate intelligence, which provide information for, for a broad audience. And the main product are our monthly climate, climate bulletins that highlight something important that happened um, for that month, and also the annual European State of the Climate Report, which is the one that I have already introduced in my first slide. And just for you to know, this year uh, we have um, dedicated one entire section to the renewable energy resources. So I really encourage you to give a look there. And um, finally, I would like to also speak about the Copernicus Energy Hub, which is also um, um, which is also uh, implemented by, by ECMWF, but uh, would like to provide an easy access to the um, to the energy information, but not only for the C3S. A service, but also for for um, coming from other Copernicus services, and uh, for that this is something that we were we launching this um, some months ago, and the idea is that users have a single entry point for all their relevant information for the energy sector. They have an easy easy access, so instead of uh, navigating through many different web pages from different. Um, from different services, just go in one and then obtain all the information. Uh, in this um, energy hub, we would like to, to, to create a community of practice around it. And um, we would like, of course, to collaborate with, um, with the energy sector, just trying to showcase how the um, the the Copernicus uh, the energy relevant data can be used for developing downstream application, and this is the my last slide. So welcome again to this series of, of webinar, and um, I will give the the floor to my colleague to present more in detail about our um, technical development for the operational service for the energy sector. Thank you very much. If you have question, please put it in the question and answer. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Nube. That was great introduction. And um, yeah, we have uh, all, also questions coming in. So they started, please, uh, as we say, tap them as they come. But that, that, that was a very good uh, way to set the scene for the uh, not only this webinar, but the whole webinar series. We'll tell you a bit more at the end. So stay stay with us until the end. We'll tell you what's happening with the webinar series. And um, and also Nube will uh, stay with us, I believe, until the end for the question and answer at the end. So, um, and, and thanks also for mentioning the uh, the state of the climate report uh, that came out yesterday. There is a very good uh, section on energy that uh, please uh, uh, have a look at that and uh, provide feedback if you wish. So um, before we start uh, with the uh, next presentations, we're going to, uh, uh, as you saw in the agenda, we have actually uh, an intermediate step, which is the poll. So, 
um, in order to uh, for us to know you uh, a little better, we are doing this uh, initial poll uh, specifically targeted at uh, the presentations we're going to hear. So if we can start the poll now, uh, we'll have three questions, three easy questions. Uh, there's no right and wrong. Just uh, put whatever your um, current knowledge of the uh, three areas. And uh, we we just like to find out more about where you coming from uh, in terms of uh, your background on the topics that we are going to cover during the webinar, and then uh, later on we'll go back to the um, to the uh, questions again, the same questions to see what uh, effect the uh, presentations has had. So um, please be as candid as possible with this. So there's, like I said, no right or wrong. It's a, it's a purely statistical thing just to see whether um, the uh, what uh, we are presenting is useful for you and uh, and will guide us in the next uh, uh, webinars as well for things that we want to do a bit more or not. I can see many questions are coming in. Thanks for uh, all your answers. So we'll give another minute uh, to to get to collect all the answers and then we'll share also you will be able to see I see that uh, uh, yeah we still got uh, a third of the people who haven't replied we're getting there we're nearly at 70 percent if you can get to 80 percent that'd be great and then we can stop uh, a few more people we need uh, Another ten percent. We're at seventy now. Uh, ten percent. We can make it. Yes, very good. We're nearly there. At uh, only two percent left to get to the magic eight eighty number. I don't know where eighty comes from, but uh, it's a good number to stop. We are nearly there, 79, another person, or two, three. I think we should get over the line with a few more people. Yeah, let's push. Okay, great, 82%. So I hope this, uh, everybody has had the chance to provide their answers. Maybe we can uh, stop here. And uh, we can also share the results just to see where we are starting from. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that, that was a great effort from uh, all of you. Uh, And uh, okay, so now we go. We can uh, start with the actual presentations on the on the technical side, and uh, I uh, will present now the first speaker. So, Dr. Letizia Luzito uh, is a data engineer at Inside Climate Service, and uh, she has a PhD in physics and extensive experience in data science, developing predictive methods and advanced algorithms for the analysis and interpretation of atmospheric ocean, is, uh, ocean and climate data and energy indicators, including the, uh, their best adjustment for public institutions, research organizations and private companies. So she has participated as scientist in many national and European projects and currently in the Citrus Energy Service. She's involved in the production of climate data, historical, seasonal forecast, and projections. So there's three streams we talked about before, and energy indicators, including their bias adjustment and in the, impl the implementation of data and software for the climate data store. And uh, Letizia is going to tell us about the processing, the met methodologies, and selected examples of global climate indicators for C3S Global Energy Climate Service. So it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Letizia. Thank you. So Thank the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Alberto, for the kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending the seminar. Let me start by sharing the screen now, the presentation. Here it is, full screen. So 
you should uh, uh, be able to see the presentation. So uh, thank you, I'm uh, Letizia Lucito and uh, my talk will, uh, will uh, cover uh, the climate indicators, uh, wind profile power law for the wind speed scaling, uh, then uh, uh, some uh, applications and examples uh, from the global climate indicators in the three streams that uh, Alberto mentioned. And finally, some applications and examples from the various adjustment methods that we are uh, currently using in the CTS energy contract. Sorry, Letizia. Um, sorry, I'm told that uh, we can't see your screen if you're sharing. If you could uh, try again sharing. Okay, oh. now, we, now we're good. Yes, good. Thank you very much. Over to you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, starting from uh, the wind profile power law, uh, so we know that the wind speed measurements are traditionally available at the 10 meters uh, above ground heights where anemometers are installed. This is uh, to clear uh, essentially the measurement from the effects of terrain, buildings and surroundings, that is to say in open ground. And here you, we, we can see a beautiful example of an anemometer installed in the Apulian countryside. But uh, how can uh, we derive the information of the wind speed? Uh, how can we uh, derive from the information of a uh, wind speed at 10 meters, uh, uh, the wind speeds at uh, uh, it's more relevant for the energy sector, for example, at the uh, the heights of uh, relevant for the wind turbines, like in this example uh, that uh, depicts the honesty offshore wind farm, uh, where uh, wind turbines reach uh, even uh, 190 meters. So uh, the studies, uh, several studies have been performed in the past and they show that the wind speed essentially uh, follows this uh, exponential curve uh, going uh, up to uh, in heights in the atmosphere. So for uh, 100,000 uh, meters uh, above, uh, essentially the behavior is uh, quite linear where the uh, winds are driven by balance between uh, the colloidal force and the local pressure while below the wind speeds are uh, deformed, uh, distorted uh, uh, because of uh, elevation uh, above, uh, above the mean surface, roughness of the sea, and the uh, dear sea temperature differences. In any case, uh, this uh, uh, behavior has been extensively studied, uh, and uh, uh, a simple equation that is the wind profile or shear power law has been derived. The equation uh, is very simple. Uh, it's uh, an exponential relationship between the wind speed at one reference height and the wind speed at another height. And essentially the ratio is uh, uh, equal to the ratio of the reference heights scaled to a certain exponent alpha. Alpha is empirically derived uh, uh, coefficient and varies uh, dependently uh, upon the stability of the atmosphere. For uh, general neutral stability conditions, it, uh, its value is approximately 1 over uh, 7, that is uh, 0.143. And uh, the application that we do of this simple uh, law in the CTS energy contract is that uh, we apply this uh, wind shear exponent uh, uh, to estimate the vertical wind profile and uh, essentially derive a wind speed information at different heights above ground in context and applications connected to the energy sector. So as I said before, uh, connected to the wind farms modeling. Uh, but also modeling of uh, wind resources for uh, renewable energy assessments. But uh, in the Citrus Energy contract, we go even a step uh, further. In particular, we uh, use uh, the era fire wind speed at 10 and 100 meters uh, scaled uh, at uh, 0.25 horizontal resolution to derive uh, a local dependent exponent. Uh, so uh, the alpha is uh, uh, computed to account for local features, but also for uh, temporal variations, uh, because we are stratifying alpha according to the time of the day and of the month. So uh, starting from uh, the historical wind speed uh, coming from uh, era five, we use this alpha to derive the climate indicator wind speed at 100 meters uh, when it is not directly available, for example, for CMIP6 projections, but also for seasonal forecast and uh, for coherence, we apply also to the past climate data. Of course, this uh, methodology has been extensively validated. Now, going uh, to the second uh, uh, argument uh, of, uh, of the talk, uh, that is to say global climate indicators. 
So we start from the historical climate indicators. They are based on the ECMWF analysis version 5 or ERA 5, where in particular we are considering five variables that are uh, the most relevant ones for the energy sector. So temperature, precipitation, wind speed at uh, 10 and 100 meters above ground level, wind direction, and uh, solar radiation at surface. So these uh, relevant climate indicate, uh, indicators have been processed to be uh, more ready to use uh, uh, in, a, in a format that is more ready to use uh, by the city uh, community, energy communities of all users and stakeholders. In particular, for the spatial resolution, we are considering uh, two spatial resolutions, a uh, graded level, so uh, data delivered in a net CDF format that is covering the entire globe but also aggregate information at the various country and, and the sub countries levels uh, for a more detailed studies uh, that involve the country, single countries. About uh, the temporary resolution, the temporary resolution currently uh, of these uh, variables is uh, daily, but uh, soon the data sets will be also uh, delivered uh, with the uh, hourly temporary resolution except the precipitation. So in the little note, you can find more details about the reanalysis uh, of ECMWF. So here uh, you can see a selected example. For example, on the left, uh, there is an animated uh, map uh, from, uh, produced from gridded products uh, that is useful to compare, for example, climate indicators uh, like a GHI in this case across uh, geographical areas, but also from a gridded product, uh, uh, time series of uh, selected locations can be extracted over a certain period of time, uh, of time to, for example, uh, study the variation of uh, uh, climate resources uh, for resource assessment, for uh, renewable energy assessments. Uh, another application, another example, is uh, depicted on, uh, on the right where time series from uh, the aggregated product, products uh, are uh, shown also concerning GHI. Uh, so for example, uh, GHI from uh, uh, five or uh, four different countries in uh, June 2006 is uh, June 2022 is a uh, uh, report that you can see that, for example, uh, of course in June, uh, GHI is quite low in Australia, but is uh, higher in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, infographics are useful also to compare climate indicators uh, uh, across countries over a certain period of time. So these are two examples from uh, the historical climate indicators. Going back to the, uh, going to the seasonal forecast, three uh, seasonal forecast models have been selected for uh, the CTS energy community, ECMWF, CMCC, and uh, DWD. All of them uh, are uh, available at uh, the native resolution of uh, one degree. And as Alberto mentioned, the, the number of in custom forecast ensemble members is quite high. And uh, this allows us uh, to also perform uh, quite advanced uh, statistical validations. The application of the seasonal forecast for the energy community is uh, essentially, again, uh, uh, the uh, production of uh, seasonal climate indicators of temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, and uh, with the speed at uh, two reference heights in the in-cast period 1993-2016 and forecast from uh, January 2023 onwards. And uh, the forecast will be continuously also updated uh, uh, in, the incoming, uh, in the incoming months. Again, also the seasonal climate indicators are available at uh, two uh, special resolutions, so grid uh, and uh, uh, aggregated uh, by countries or sub-countries. And uh, uh, essentially they, are, uh, uh, they will be delivered also to the stakeholders and energy communities in the uh, incoming months. For the climate projections, we are basically, we are, uh, uh, basing our selections on the CMIP-6 projections, um, the, the most advanced uh, uh, climate projections are currently available. Uh, CMIP-6 uh, uh, co comprises uh, several um, uh, shared uh, socio-economic uh, scenarios, 
there are further more or less in total with the different levels of emissions and therefore different levels of temperature rise foreseen in the future. But for the CTS energy community, we selected in particular two scenarios only. The middle one, so the 245 and the 370. And from the high number of CIMIP-6 projections models, there are around 50 models. We selected the four, possibly to become a six at the end of the contract. And this selection has been based on a model component independence, availability of reasonable horizontal and temporal resolution, and maximum variability in the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So, for example, just to give you an idea, from uh, the original time resolution of three hours and spatial resolution of uh, uh, 100 kilometers of these uh, uh, models at their native resolution, we are avail available to interpolate them uh, at uh, quarter degree resolution and uh, hourly, uh, hourly or daily temporal resolution. Uh, so, quite uh, an, uh, an advancement. Uh, at, uh, at the end of the contract, uh, uh, the time series, the complete time series up to uh, 2,100 uh, will be uh, available, as well as, uh, again, different levels of uh, spatial aggregations created and uh, aggregated by countries or uh, sub-countries. A selected example uh, for climate indicators, uh, uh, the projection stream, essentially uh, extracting time series for a particular country is uh, useful to, for example, for a different mix of uh, models and scenarios. So it's useful to compare the influence of scenarios, uh, fixed model, or, uh, for example, the influence of the different couplings in the different models uh, fixing the uh, scenario. So, and this, uh, for example, gives a better estimation of the uncertainty of uh, the um, plant projection for the future. So, going uh, to the best adjustment methods, um, and the uh, applications uh, and uh, examples. Uh, so as uh, you read in the introduction, um, essentially general, uh, general circulation models uh, present systematic biases with respect to observations or uh, um, uh, regional climate models. These systematic biases are essentially model errors caused by imperfect uh, concept, uh, conceptualizations, discretizations, coarse uh, representation of regional features, and uh, the simple uh, spatial averaging within model grid cells for computation. So, bias adjustment is uh, uh, the most adopted method to provide, uh, I will not say corrected but uh, adjusted climate scenarios. So it's a calibration of an empirical transfer function between a simulated and observed distribution over an historical period that can be used to adjust the climate model output over, for example, a future period. So it is a statistical post-processing step, often quite computationally intense because uh, uh, it consists essentially in the adjustment of selected statistics. Some of them are very easy, like mean variance, uh, et cetera. Uh, some of them uh, are also more complex, like uh, um, cumulative distribution functions. Uh, here, uh, in this uh, summary table, uh, you can see an overview of the best adjustment methods that we are currently applying in the CTNS energy contract. The simple method is the delta method, where the adjustment of a source data set is based on a target, uh, based on a target variable. It's done by simply calculating the change factor or these uh, anomalies or deltas. And then uh, uh, this uh, delta is then applied to the future uh, time series that we want to correct to estimate the bias corrected uh, variable in the, in the future. So it's uh, the delta essentially is a simple scaling adjustment of the source data set. So the data set that, uh, is biased with uh, these delta factors. Then a bit more complex is the quantile mapping, uh, where basically the correction or the adjustment is uh, um, 
calculated uh, by mapping uh, the model the cumulative uh, uh, distribution functions of the bar variable of interest to the observed one. So, uh, sorry. So essentially, we look at a particular value in the model time series. We look at which quantile corresponds. We look at the corresponding value in the observational CDF that corresponds to that particular quantile. And therefore, we calculate the correction. Now, uh, the CDFT or cumulative distribution function transform is uh, quite similar to the quantile mapping, but uh, by simple, by looking at this simple graph, it's, uh, you can see a fundamental difference. In the quantile mapping, uh, the CDFT, uh, the CDFs uh, that are considered that are only two. When the, in the CDFT method, uh, we have uh, four, uh, um, four uh, CDF. This is because uh, the CDFT keeps into account, for example, uh, changes in the future of the CDF that are uh, particularly useful when we are dealing with the temperature in the context of climate projections, uh, where indeed the temperature we know that uh, is constantly rising and therefore uh, the CDF uh, changes constantly its, uh, its properties, its, uh, its form. So what we do is uh, typically we uh, continue to keep uh, uh, to calculate this mapping from a target and source uh, uh, data sets in a common historical period. But instead of applying the correction to the simple model the CDF, we apply the correction to the uh, predictant curve, uh, that is to say the time series of, uh, for example, the um, temperature in the, in the future, so even in the far future. In this way, we are able to, uh, to apply a corrections based on DIRA5, so on the historical properties of a more precise model, but still keeping the uh, trend due to the climate change. We will see a better example uh, later. So the application for the CTS energy community in particular, so this is our forecast where we don't have this problem of correcting for the trend in the climate change. So a simple method can be used uh, is based on a quantile mapping. So the, the middle one of, uh, of before. Well, of course, for climate projections, uh, uh, we need to account, uh, to, we need to keep into account the, uh, the climate change. So for example, temperature is uh, corrected uh, using the cumulative distribution function transform with the moving windows so that we are able to estimate uh, much better the trends. The same goes for uh, precipitation and wind speed at 10, uh, 10 meters, where we use the CDFT, but uh, without moving windows because uh, the climate change uh, doesn't impact these variables so much. Well, for GHI to, uh, in any case, trying to opti optimize computational methods, so we use the delta method that is much simpler with respect to the other two methods. Here we see uh, an example. So the CDFT in action. Here the source uh, PDF, uh, CDF uh, is calculated from uh, the 1995-2014 CMIP6 uh, uh, projection uh, model uh, specified here in the, uh, in the text. And it's the temperature, of course, the target is the era five in the same uh, uh, calibration period. The predictand is uh, the temperature of the CMIP6 projections in the scenario 245 in the future. And the corrected is uh, what comes out from the application of the bias adjustment. So you see, we calculate the essentially corrections that allows us to bring uh, to go from the source to the target. And the same correction is applied or mapping or uh, transfer function is applied to the predictant to reach the, uh, to, to, to derive the corrected the adjusted uh, data set. Especially important, particularly important is that in the CDFT method, the low high end details of the predictant, that is uh, essentially the climate change signals are preserved because you see we are able uh, to reach the I and the tail of the distribution, so a very high values of temperature that can be found in the predictant time series, also if they are not present in the original source uh, 
CDF. Same goes from uh, for low values for the uh, case of, uh, for example, uh, very scarce precipitations. So coming back to conclusions, uh, I tried to summarize here the other values of the CTRS uh, to energy contract, uh, in particular uh, uh, explaining how the wind shear power law is used to derive the wind speed at tides that are relevant for the wind power simulations, also for climate projections where uh, they are not normally available to users' communities. Then the bias adjustment that is used to minimize biases uh, in uh, climate projections, making them more useful to renewable energy assessment, but preserving the climate change trends. And then uh, I finally wanted to uh, thank the uh, users, stakeholders, and these MWF and CS communities for their continuous engagement and feedbacks that allows us to continuously improve uh, the delivery of climate indicators. So next step, of course, we will continue with the further assessment of ERA-5 and SMIP-6 uh, TAMTP indicators. Uh, we are going to publish, uh, of course, the data and procedures, and we will continue with uh, further engagement with users and stakeholders and training activities like uh, uh, this one. So please uh, uh, don't be shy and submit your questions through the Q&A button. Thank you very much. Over to you, Alberto. That's excellent. Thank you very much, Letizia. There is a, a, a lot of material that uh, need to be digested here. And again, uh, remember that the presentation, the webinar will be uh, provided as a recording um, as soon as possible after the webinar. But also you have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we've seen a few questions coming in. Thanks for uh, the questions. There is one uh, particular question uh, I think it's not an issue to have questions in different languages, but um, uh, if we could ask uh, Claudia to clarify a little the uh, question, please to maybe rephrase it a little, that would be helpful. And, uh, and we'll proceed to uh, answer that. And uh, also maybe we can take it on at the Q&A session later. Um, okay, so uh, we now, we can uh, move to the next uh, presentation on uh, on what uh, the contract is doing uh, in terms of uh, climate indicators and tools. Um, so, so there's uh, quite a lot of uh, information already, but there's more to come here with the next presentation by Stefano Campostrini, also at uh, Inside Climate Service. So uh, Stefano is, uh, has a, a BSc in physics and uh, a master's in environmental meteorology and experience in deep learning models in the creation of climate and, and creation of data pipelines. Uh, currently uh, uh, with the uh, C3S Energy Service is involved in the production of climate data, historical seasonal forecast and projections, as well as the development of various software tools uh, for their analysis, as you will see in a minute. So Stefan is going to tell us about this. Uh, some of the tools, there are many more, but uh, we uh, provided uh, here, uh, um, we selected uh, some of the tools that have been developed for climate data processing. We'll talk specifically about temporal downscaling, exclusion layers, and uh, special aggregation. So. It's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Stefano now for the presentation. Thank you, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto, for the kind introduction. Thank you also to, to Letizia and Nuga for the presentations before. And uh, yes, so I will start by sharing my screen. Share, and hopefully you can all see the screen. So, yeah, um, as Alberto said, I will be um, presenting to you the tools that uh, ICS has been uh, developing in the uh, in the context of the C three S Energy Service, and uh, yeah, together together with uh, together with uh, other institutions, these tools, the tools that uh, I will be presenting today, are. As the title suggested, and as you have all seen in the uh, webinar pamphlets, uh, it will be the temporal interpolation tool that has been 
developed mainly to interpolate this data sets from three hour to uh, one hour temporary resolution, as is the case for the CIMIC 6 uh, rejection data sets. And uh, then the exclusion area composition tool, which is a tool that, uh, as the name suggests, uh, helps in uh, producing uh, a, a mask that uh, allows uh, for the masking of all areas that might uh, be not of interest to the user when they are creating their data processing pipelines. And in our specific case, this is in for their use in the spatial aggregation tool, which is used to compute mean value of uh, grid data of for temperature, wind speed, and so on over specific regions that are defined in shape files. So the exclusion area, for example, we uh, the exclusion area composition tool we are using to create exclusion uh, exclusion areas that are used in the spatial aggregation tool so that we don't consider certain certain grid points in the aggregation of the of the climate and energy data. So we'll start with the temporal interpolation tool. The temporal interpolation tool is not the same for all climate variables, but it's uh, subdivided in two tools. The first one he uses the spline, um, uses splines to interpolate data, and is mainly applied to temperature and and wind speed. It takes three days uh, of data, and applies the interpolation to these three days of data, and then only keeps the middle of this time window, and then iterates over days. This. Uh, this is a pointwise. Um, this is a pointwise tool that, uh, so to say, respects the um, available data points, and is useful in those cases where the variables are pointwise. Uh, in actually, instantaneous variable is the is the correct term, such as temperature and wind speed. Whereas for the global horizontal irradiance, the interpolation of of GHI, which uh, is the name I will use from, from now on, is to use the uh, information of from the diurnal cycle in the interpolation of this uh, of of this uh, climate variable. What is interpolated is not GHI, but actually clearness index, and uh, we'll see in the next slide what this is. I'm oh, sorry, in a, in a further slide. Well, let's start first with uh, an example of the spline interpolation, interpolation tool. As you can see, the interpolated data in blue respects the original data. So all all grid points, um, all the interpolated uh, points are um, go through, or actually a line that would go through this interpolated point goes also through the original Three, uh, three hour data and this is the case for um for um, for the surface air temperatures we have in this example for the downscaling of solar irradiance the um interpolation of ghi is not uh, as effective uh, if done directly also the ghi variable when a downloaded is a variable that is referred to uh, to um, a certain time period, which would be three hours. And in this case, it's the the mean value of GHI in the three hours uh, of the uh, the three hours that are being considered. So what's interpolated is that is actually the so-called clearness index, which is uh, a detrended indicator that is linked to atmosphere transmissivity. And uh, after this uh, clearness index is interpolated, this is reconverted to irradiance using the um, top of atmosphere um, radiation that is computed through, uh, through some 
already predefined and, 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 and preset tools that are open source and openly available like SG2. There's a limitation though, that uh, this tool assumes that uh, there's stable weather inside, inside of each uh, uh, of the original time steps. This is, I also want to specify this tool is uh, been developed by Admin and uh, we have uh, implemented it into, into our two pipeline. I mean, it's our collaborator in this, uh, this C3, in the context of the 3C, C3S energy service, operational service. This is an example of uh, the temporal interpolation of global uh, horizontal radiance. As you can see, the profile of the interpolated data seems to be shifted a tiny bit to the left, but this is expected because as, uh, um, as I said before, the original values refer to a time, pe a time period of three hours and they can be interpreted as a mean of, uh, of GHI over the period of, of three hours. So in a sense, uh, this interpolation is a uh, reverse or actually inverse of the um, rolling mean average. In fact, if, just, if you interpret the blue points as a rolling mean of the red points, it, it, starts, it starts to make sense. So an example of how this tool might be used is through, um, uh, is uh, like this. Now, C3S Utilities is a uh, um, um, name that is, uh, is a placeholder for now, but uh, it will be um, implemented in EarthKit, that is an open source tool that is uh, being developed by ECNWF. And um, I hope you're all familiar with some Python syntax, but it's quite easy. You open some data with the XRA and uh, and you plug in your, your data set inside the appropriate function, in this case for GHI. Let's uh, move on to the exclusion area composition tool. The exclusion area composition tool is, uh, as I said before, to um, it's used to put all areas together that uh, you might not want to utilize inside your data processing pipeline, which might be wind generation modeling, PV generation modeling, or in a more simple case, the uh, aggregation of data. Uh, these are these are the list of the aggregation of the exclusion areas that are available for composition, and the combination of these exclusion areas is actually quite simple. Uh, they are Boolean masks, and one stands for exclusion, zero stands for inclusion, and they are combined with a simple or logical operator. And in the end, the final max is just the union of all the combined exclusion masks. So we have an example here for high elevation areas. The first image, don't let uh, yourself be fooled by the different colors you, you were just picked in order to to show that the first one is actually a, a so-called base exclusion uh, mask. And the second one is a, an exclusion mask that's composed of other exclusion masks. And as you can see, the first one, high elevation areas, shows the areas that are being excluded in, in I would say, purple. And uh, the, se the second image is the combined exclusion areas for PV generation modeling. And as you can see, the high elevation areas exclusion mask was used for uh, producing the combined exclusion area um, for PV modeling. How might this tool be used? Again, C3S Utilities is here now a placeholder, and we will just use it as simple as calling it with exclusion areas composition and giving a list of, uh, of com exclusion Areas that you want to combine into a single data set. And this data set will be, of course, a, a common X ray data set. Now, to go into the last tool, which is spatial aggregation. The spatial aggregation tool, as I said before, serves to aggregate data spatially 
It maintains the same temporary resolution with the aggregate data spatially using some shape files as inputs and also uh, Lancy mask. The shape files and Lancy mask get united into a gridded mask uh, that uh, should uh, represent the shape file, uh, actually the borders, for example, of a region. Let's make uh, uh, another example, which is Italy, we'll see afterwards. And uh, these borders are used to, to, to create this mask that, is, that will be a float mask, uh, for example, around the borders, so that we don't consider border pixels entirely inside a entirely inside one state, for example. And Lancy mask is used, for example, for lakes and also coastlines. Then the special, the actual spatial aggregation is performed and the latitudinal adjustment is performed because uh, the grids we are normally using are regular grids in degrees, and the more towards the poles you go, the the higher their um, their their importance would be if they were not corrected. So you 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 correct them with the with the cosine, and then you can use exclusion areas as we saw before to exclude some areas in the process of aggregation and some population mass if you want to weight some climate data with the help of population data. Now, of course, what we will also give to the special aggregation tool is the input grid data of the variable that we want to aggregate. And the output is a simple aggregated CSV. Now, an example for the local, for the, um, sorry, for the global, uh, for the global domain, the admin zero level global shape file, for example, can be used. And as you can see, you can see the, the highest administrative uh, regions. And to the right, you see an example of a, um, of a floating point mask that is developed through the through the through the aggregation tool. So what's the end product? The end product is something like this. This is an example on monthly um, monthly air temperature. The original file was uh, an NC file, an NCDF, with uh, 0 0.25 degrees resolution. And it was already aggregated at, uh, it was already um, uh, brought to a one month, uh, one monthly resolution, point by point. And then this special aggregation was performed with the tool I, um, I explained a few seconds ago. And, and the, the final plot shows what the, what the end result is. The for the purpose of the plot, uh, the data were, were brought to Celsius, but uh, the initial CSV was in Kelvin because the starting data was actually in Kelvin. And yes, so this is the the, the the end product. When we go to see how this tool might be used, it is a tiny bit more complex, but uh, don't let yourself be scared by. A uh, few more lines. In the end, it's quite simple. You import your the library that you're developing. As I said before, this will be present in EarthKit, and uh, you also import your pandas and XRA. Your pandas is for shape files, and XRA is for, again for opening your net CDFs. You open your data. You open the uh, the regions that you want to use some exclusion areas that are of course optional and the Lancy mask. And then you call your spatial aggregation function in from, from the Citrius utilities library. You plug in all of your variables and uh, latitude uh, weighting gets done hopefully automatically, but we will see um, this is uh, probably uh, something that can be generalized. And what you uh, the end result that you get is a, is a simple um, uh, pandas data frame that after 
after this computation can be saved to CSV. So this is um, yeah, this is the end of the presentation. I hope uh, um, that the tools are now a bit more clear in what they do. And uh, yes, so thank you again. Thank you for the floor and uh, over to you, Alberto. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. That was uh, great. Uh, I think, again, a lot of details. And uh, also, we started to see some coding for those of you uh, who are interested also in taking uh, some of the tools that are developed. Um, as uh, Stefano also mentioned, uh, this will be integrated into the new system at ECNWF, uh, the new climate data store, uh, which is built upon this uh, Earth kit and uh, a lot of new tools would be available. Um, so we, we are preparing them uh, uh, for you and uh, in uh, due time, we'll have access to these tools as well as the data. So a lot of, uh, a lot of information coming out. So like we said, uh, the, the, the overall uh, contract is looking to transit to a climate, to a global system from the European uh, domain which we have at present and uh and so it is uh, quite a lot of uh, work involved because if you think about the domain of europe is uh, about uh, 15 percent or so of the whole globe then uh, obviously we don't look at all the oceans uh, so that uh, that's a good uh, saving but uh, still it's a small proportion of the whole globe and plus the actual uh, energy data we are quite lucky in Europe because we got one of the best data sets in terms of energy, which is uh, critical for uh, you know, training our models and, and so on. So uh, I would like to invite now uh, back all the speakers for the Q&A session. So we've had uh, some questions already on the chat and uh, our speakers have been so kind to answer the questions. So um if there's uh, if there's more questions please uh, type them in i see that uh, they're coming we can also go back to some of the questions that have been uh, already answered because um yeah there's uh, always a limit to what we can say in uh, in writing it may be useful also to expand a little bit on the on the questions but um if you uh, we we go now First to the new questions, there is a few questions. Uh, so the, um, like we said, the, 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 the webinar will be recorded. And, uh, and so uh, basically you will see the presentations, but uh, most likely we'll also share the presentations. I don't think there is any issue with that. So thanks, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Murari Lal for the question and attendance. There's a, uh, question uh, uh, for uh, let's say Stefano about the um, tools the module the C3S utilities module so um, where can I find uh, this module yes so thank you thank you Vincenzo for the for the question so the name is actually a mock name um, that was uh, created for the purpose of this uh, of this presentation, just to have you um, um, uh, have you get an idea of how the tools might be used. But they will be available inside of our EarthKit. I think you can find um, if you type uh, EarthKit on Google or on, on GitHub, you will find uh, you would find it quite easily. They are not uh, in EarthKit yet. But they will be, and uh, then for their utilization, it's uh, it it will be as easy as installing another library with uh, pip install if you're familiar with uh, Python, and uh, I don't know if there's a plan to have it also with uh, Conda if you're more familiar with Conda. So these are a bit more technical details uh, if someone's not familiar with them. But uh, yeah, that's. Uh, that's how uh, that's how you actually get the the library. So I can't I can't simplify more. Okay, so there seems to be uh, 
also some other interest in the tools. So there is another question for you, Stefano. Uh, it says, uh, uh, Sushant uh, is asking whether they can modify the tools as per their requirements. Is it yes. an open source, any Git link? So um, EarthKit is indeed open source. Uh, I'm not developing EarthKit, so I don't want to <laughs> get too much into in the EarthKit, we will have a process in which we integrate these tools that we are developing as ICS into uh, into EarthKit. But uh, since it will be available to EarthKit and EarthKit is open source, indeed you will be able to um, modify the code as you as you wish, uh, since it's uh, um, yeah, since it's open source and it's uh, and it's Python. So yeah, yes, it's in for 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 that and you know um, it will be available on on github so i see okay, it's thank Nube. you yeah so yeah i was going to ask nube actually to uh complement the question uh over to you nube thanks yes thank you um yes basically the the idea behind the the energy service that we are developing is just um having um open uh, access to the workflow and to the um, to the data behind so say that of course all this uh, application that we are developing for within earthkit will be open and available to everyone to download it and uh, use for downstream application so this is uh, more or less the the whole idea of the copernicus climate change service so having some tools that can be available for user to download it and create and create downstream application for your um fit for your purpose so yes still is 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 not um still is not there because we are currently developing all the service but but uh, as i said before i think the data will be ready by the end of summer or something like that in the climate data store and um, hopefully we can have available as well the the uh, the script behind uh, the workflows. Okay, thank you very much, Nuba. We uh, still have a, a few minutes for question and answer, and then we'll have the second poll, like I said before. So please uh, hang on uh, because uh, we don't want to have a skewed statistics. Uh, if too many people leave, then we don't know what. Uh, how to compare the previous poll. So please stay just for a couple more minutes here for the questions, because there were some uh, also interesting questions that were asked before. And uh, they, although they've been uh, addressed uh, on, uh, on the chat, maybe uh, we want to expand a little bit very quickly, for example, on the CMIP6 climate scenarios, when it says you sit down scale that which resolution and data sets uh, are available. So maybe we can start with Letizia and then uh, if others want to add. Yes. So Nube, so, yeah, Nube Letizia already provided the answer, but uh, yeah, Letizia, please. Yes, so the question is uh, if for the for the CMIP6 uh, climate scenarios, if they will be downscaled and which resolution. So, uh, of course, uh, the CMIP6 projections uh, uh, models are uh, very high in number. They are, I think, uh, around there are 50 models and uh, more and more are coming in. And uh, we cannot uh, analyze or uh, provide uh, uh, all of them through the citrus uh, energy. And therefore, we chose a, a subsample of uh, representative scenarios and models. And uh, I will uh, come back uh, to what representative means in a, in a while. And we decided to uh, apply these uh, tools that uh, Stefano so nicely explained to downscale them, uh, both at temporal and spatial resolutions. So for these uh, six uh, models uh, and uh, each one uh, based on two scenarios, we will provide uh, uh, downscale the data sets uh, at the native era file resolution, so quarter degree spatial resolution. And from for the temporal resolution, we'll go from the original three hour uh, uh, CMIP6 uh, resolution to one hour resolution. 
And uh, the selection of the, these representative models was based on uh, model uh, independence, uh, because of course what uh, it's important to do with the climate projections is to, to create uh, an ensemble of uh, uh, models that can uh, represent the uncertainties that all these models carry uh, within themselves, uh, because natively we cannot, uh, no model is perfect enough, and for the projections, we have the problem of having to estimate conditions that we will be real, uh, will be realized in the future. So we don't have, let's say, uh, the feedback coming from a uh, comparison with the observations. So, so we have to do all these um, uh, analysis uh, a little bit in a blind way. So we need to, to estimate the errors uh, by estimating how far these models. Uh, uh, predict uh, how far are the predictions of uh, each one of these models from each other. So uh, for these reasons, uh, we selected the models that have a uh, component, uh, independent components. Uh, for those of you that do not know, the CMIP-6 projections have, uh, are based, uh, are coupled models uh, where all the systems uh, of the Earth interact uh, with each other. So we have a model that models uh, atmosphere, another one for us, another one for land, another one for the atmosphere, and another one for the human uh, part, let's say CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 uh, human let's say, factors. So all these interact uh, and uh, we try to take models where all these uh, components uh, are different in order to have the best variability. And um, uh, this and also the equilibrium climate sensitivity is another important uh, parameter that uh, we choose to uh, look at when you know, we need to select uh, this representative ensemble of CMIP-6 projections. And uh, these are, uh, only this representative ensemble of CMIP-6 projections will be delivered at uh, higher uh, temper and spatial resolution, but because simply the computational resources are not uh, uh, infinite and we need to, to do a choice. Okay, thank you very much, Letizia, for this comprehensive answer. I uh, don't know whether Nube or Stefano want to add anything to that. No? Not really on that, but um, I will take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the um, Climate Atlas, that is the interactive visualizator that um, we can uh, you can access through the uh, Copernicus Climate Data Store. And uh, in that visualizator, you can choose different um, climate change projection. And then you can visualize all over the world and you can choose a particular area. And then you can see um, all the different uh, essential climate variables. Uh, you can choose a different period of time for the future. And um, Yes, and also it's possible to uh, to compare with uh, with the reanalysis. So I I don't know. I really encourage you to play a little bit with this um, new application that we have uh, launched uh, in the last February, and um, hopefully can be useful for some of you. Of course, uh, the visualizator that we have now they are in the nati native resolution. But then um, within the, um, the energy contract in the second phase of the operational service for the energy sector, we are planning to develop some um, application and um, maybe we can end up with some nice visualization more targeting for the energy sector in which we can visualize a projection down a scale. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Nube. There's uh, one question that, that I'll try to interpret. Uh, so in terms of applications, uh, I guess, uh, for the energy sector, which uh, uh, also are addressing the increasing financial materiality of physical risks for a wide range of businesses. Um, so in... in uh, as I showed at the beginning, but very, very quickly, we are producing indicators mainly for the renewable energy industry. There, there is, uh, in terms of uh, physical risks, uh, we are looking uh, particularly at the projections. 
and projections related to, for example, solar farm uh, projects, uh, the financing of solar farm and the how um, a future climate could uh, affect the financing of, uh, of solar farms. So, so this would be one example of uh, practical application. So this is uh, actually one of the case studies that we are addressing and uh, in, in the contract, and that will come later, actually, that uh, uh, also preempts a bit the, um, what uh, I'm going to say about the next webinars. So I won't say more because uh, we'll, uh, we'll see in a minute. Uh, I think uh, we we can uh, wrap up here for the question and answer. I'd just like now to move to the second poll. So thanks uh, all the speakers for the question and answer. We'll uh, we'll come back to uh, final thanks at the at the end. Before we lose too many people, I'd like to go to the second poll. So uh, I think this again, this uh, are the same questions as before. So, uh, which you answered uh, candidly, and uh, we'd like to see whether through the uh, webinar we uh, have changed the statistics. Hopefully, they have improved, so we have uh, higher numbers. It could go also the other way, but hopefully not. And hopefully, you have also uh, followed all the presentations. So I know there is a recording, but. Uh, if you follow the presentation, so fully you've uh, learned, and uh, and the the numbers are higher now, more towards the five than the one. And I can see uh, just looking at the numbers as they come in that uh, we have uh, now uh, a more uh, a higher distribution. Before, in the previous poll, we had a, uh, the largest uh, distribution was around three four. Now we have some. Uh, Fives also. There's more five uh, in uh, in, the, in the two first question and the last question. We're aiming for a few more respondents if we can. Otherwise, we, the statistic will be too skewed and uh, not very useful. So if I can ask to for a last effort, uh, we still have several people who uh, haven't responded. If we can. Uh, uh, just put uh, a few questions. I'll leave a minute for you to answer. Okay, in the meantime, seems that we reached a uh, uh, plateau. So I um, just, uh, let's see if we can uh, go a bit farther. I'll, uh, I'm going to share now the presentation while you finish uh, typing. I think we, yeah, we don't seem to be moving from there. So I think, uh, yeah, we can stop there. Thank you very much also for filling this uh, second poll. And, uh, and so in wrapping up the session, I just want to mention the, uh, the rest of the webinar series. So this is where we are at the moment. Uh, we've uh, completed the webinar one. Well, actually in a few minutes, the stuff is not completed yet. And uh, then uh, the plan is to have uh, three other webinars uh, and uh, maybe uh, some of them uh, will be split, particularly the next one with the global energy indicators because there's a lot of uh, material to cover. So they, uh, the Global Energy Indicators uh, Webinar 2 will be scheduled uh, in July. Then uh, quarter 4 to 2024, we'll talk about the case studies. We have two case studies, one which I mentioned before, and another one uh, which I won't say what it is, so you can come back uh, quarter 4 to learn more about that. And then uh, quarter 1, 2025, we'll have an update on the global climate and energy products, uh, so all the improvements that we made and access to the data and, and all the other things that you uh, will uh, uh, want to know about all the work that we've been doing under this contract. So um, I, before we uh, close, I want to really thank uh, uh, the speakers, of course, for the great presentations, keeping on time, great content, and uh, also our uh, partners in the contract. So we have uh, 
in hell edf uh, armin and uh also a an, uh, partner working on the solar energy and uh um so uh, ever whose uh, company is called everos and uh um and of course the support uh, from uh, uh, c3s for all the work we've been doing here you can find all the points uh, and links uh, all the social media web pages and so on where you can find information about uh, the Copernicus in general, and then uh, from there you uh, be, should be able to navigate through the C3S Energy or come back to our site where you found the uh, registration. Uh, sorry for the uh, uh, registration for under the uh, Inside Climate Service uh, website where you find more information, including the recording, but you will uh, receive uh, also the, inf the information through the uh, link uh, that uh, Zoom will send with the location of the recording. And for any other questions, please um, uh, come back to us. And uh, if you want to learn more or collaborate, uh, we'll uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. So thank you again, everybody, for a great webinar. And until the next time in July 2024, bye now.